All right, my 15 minute blocks turn out to be more like a half an hour blocks, but we'll charge ahead here and see what we get to. Okay, so um, I, you know, I mentioned when we have this evaporation from a water body like a lake, that can produce a distinctive isotope composition in the vapor that's produced, right, in terms of the deuterium excess in particular. Uh, the other side of this process is evapoconcentration. It's what happens to the residual water that's left behind in the lake or in the stream or in a leaf, okay? Um, and by mass balance, you know, we're removing vapor which has a different isotopic composition than the initial pool that we started with, let's say the initial lake water. So what happens to the delta values of the remaining liquid? Yeah. All right, they get enriched. Yeah, we're removing light material with a high DXS value, and that means the stuff that's left behind gets heavier and its DXS value gets lower. Okay. And so we can visualize that uh, on one of these lines. We'll do that in a second. Okay. So we can model this process using Raleigh distillation also. It's just the reverse of what we talked about before, really, right? So now we're removing something light instead of removing something heavy. We're looking at the evolution of the residual material as it comes on, uh, as it comes along. Okay. The isotope composition of the residual water in the lake or the leaf or whatever is going to depend on the, uh, a number of things. The initial isotopic composition, right, our starting point would be our R sub zero in the Raleigh model. Uh, it's going to depend on the fraction of the water evaporated or F term in the Raleigh model. And then it's going to depend on the alpha term. And the alpha term here can be a little more complicated. It's uh, going to depend on the, it's going to be ultimately the isotopic composition, the evaporative flux. But in some systems, we also have to consider the back flux, right? And this becomes really important for things like leaves where we have a very small pool of water, right? Again, diffusion is trading molecules in both directions. And so it turns out the isotopic composition of the vapor in the atmosphere is important as well in determining the net fractionation or the net evolution of the composition of the residual water, right? If you have a small pool of water and the amount of water diffusing back into the leaf, or back into the liquid pool, right, uh, is going to contribute substantially to the mass of water that we have, okay? So just keep that in mind, and I think um, that'll probably come up as we talk about leaf water in the class over time here. All right. Uh, for large pools of water, um, large bodies of water, say a large lake, uh, we can use the evaporation line uh, and show the change in the lake water composition, for example, as we remove water through evaporation. So here's what we looked at before. We've got our vapor there, that first star on the left, very high deuterium excess values. And so, you know, in a very kind of simple conceptual sense, the residual water, lake water, is going to move along an evaporation line in the opposite direction, right? We just extend that evaporation line up to the top right direction. And over time, as more and more water is lost from the lake, right, we can use our Raleigh model, and it's going to give us an uh, evolution of that water isotope composition that way. So we can use that then to characterize um, uh, the amount of evaporation that's occurred, which is something that's often difficult to, to measure in a sample. Okay, so um, here are some different water bodies. We're going to look at rivers here in different places on Earth. And these are now evaporation lines for these rivers. And you can see that they're different, right? So you can see that they reflect different, the differences kind of reflect different factors that affect these. So one is the source water isotope composition, right? And the source water for the, you know, Darling different River is different than the source water for the Rio Grande, right? Where is this uh, Darling is on Australia, the Amazon is in the Amazon, and uh, the Rio Grande, uh, or Rio Grande is uh, in uh, the southwestern U.S starts in southern Colorado mountains and then flows down to the Gulf of Mexico. So, so the Rio Grande is getting mountain water, <coughs> which is fairly light. The Darling River is getting water from Australia, which is fairly heavy. Amazon's maybe somewhere in the middle, but it's got some light water coming from uh, the high Andes. So that's expressed here in terms of kind of where these clusters of data show up. But you can also see that the lines that we plot here are different, that the evaporation lines are different. And it's actually, I'm doing a disservice here. These are not, these are, I, 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 be careful about thinking about these as evaporation lines because what we're seeing here is a, potentially a mixture of processes, right? 
So we clearly have evaporation happening, right? These low slopes, the slope of 5, 5.1, it's something like that, right? Those are slopes we'd expect to see for evaporation, where kinetic effects are expressed, right? Why might we have different slopes for the Amazon versus evaporation in the Amazon versus evaporation in the southwestern U.S.? Yeah? Humidity. Humidity is different, right? So Amazon's pretty wet, and down here in the southwestern U.S., we've got low relative humidity, more expression of the kinetic effect in the area the Rio Grande's flowing through, okay? So that means a lower slope for our evaporation line. The cautionary note, and I'm working on a paper right, this, right on this right now, which is the only reason I really want to point this out, but um, these are samples collected on these rivers at different places and at different times, okay? And so evaporation, differences in evaporation are one thing that might be affecting the variability we see here, might be driving the variability, right? One place we might have sampled water that's experienced more evaporation, right? More evaporative water loss since it fell out of the sky, okay? But if we're sampling at different places and at different times, sources can be varying too, right? So we may have tributaries in the Amazon, for example, that are contributing a lot of really heavy water, you know, way up there, but you see some Amazon samples way down here as well, right? Uh, those are probably from the headwaters, places where all the water in the stream at that place is coming from the high Andes. And so there's multiple processes being represented here. And for the Amazon, it's you know, probably an extreme end member of that, but the same thing's probably happening in these other river samples too. And so I would not think of this as simply an evaporation line, right? Even though that's what I've written up here, because it's mixing processes, right? A true evaporation line is showing us how the isotope compositions are evolving as evaporation happens, where that's the process, right, that we're seeing. And if we have a true evaporation line, we can look at the slope and it'll tell us something about the conditions under which evaporation occurred, how humid it was, you know, et cetera, okay. You have to be a little careful with it here. The other thing, so that's spewing my um, uh, uh, perspective on what you shouldn't do here. The other thing that is you should be careful about here is that sometimes these kinds of lines are referred to as meteoric water lines, okay? If you go out and you sample an evaporating river, okay, then you're not getting a meteoric water line in the same sense that you are if you go out and you sample precipitation water, right? You're getting a representation of what local water in rivers looks like in HO space, but what you're not seeing is really that atmospheric, right? Meteoric water means water from the sky, right? When we do a meteoric water line, we're interested in characterizing that ultimate source of water, the precipitation that's falling out of the sky. And if you do this, you're mixing processes. So what we have here is not purely an evaporation line. It's not purely a meteoric water line. It's something in between. It carries lots of information. It's very interesting. But there are issues in the literature sometimes with people conflating these two. So if you think about it, it's obvious, right, that you got to be careful about how you think about these lines. You can't just go out and measure a bunch of samples. You guys don't think this is funny? <laughs> Come on. Uh, so this is what I just said. Evaporation lines, local meteoric water lines. Think about what they actually mean and what somebody's showing you and where the data's coming from. When you go and collect data, if you've got water isotope data, think about it. Think about what the processes are that are actually affecting that. All right. This is a... Great big mass spectrometer, much, uh, well, I wouldn't say much cooler. I guess it is much cooler than the ones upstairs in some ways. But uh, this is the prime facility at uh, Purdue. This is a whole basement. It's the size of a football field that's filled with mass spectrometer. Questions about uh, the evaporation process, meteoric water lines, stuff we just covered?